Well, this is the Encounter Faith Podcast. My name is Ross Cochran, and I am thrilled to be sitting down with Pastor Barbara Roberts. Hello. Thank you for doing this. Hello. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to dig into what you talked about recently uh, in your sermon on Sunday, but I want to start because you are someone who you describe yourself. I'm just going to jump right in because we have so much to get to, and I don't want to waste any more time uh, of your time. I have a lot more time to kill than you do. Um, <laughs> But you described yourself as a mission and community development enthusiast when you were introducing this message. And in, I loved that term, but can you help folks who are listening as we get started? What does that mean to you? Yeah, that's a good question. I was trying to unpack a lot of things that I'm passionate about when I yeah. said that. So I was like, this seems like a good catch-all phrase for it. Um, when I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a missionary, like traditional missionary, go to the mission field, tell people about Jesus. I think when I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a dinosaur. So oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. My kindergarten teacher actually told me like, you know, you could die if you're a missionary, right? And I, so I don't know why you tell that to a kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a Christian school, but anyway, that's a whole other, that's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but over time that passion for missions has grown and developed. And I realized that, um, one of the strengths of being a missionary in another space coming from the U S is someone who can help empower people to do community development well in their mm. communities, um, ascribing dignity to them and helping them create change in their own spaces through the resources that they already have in their hand. Um, so I've gotten to do that through a couple different mission trips, mission organizations and community development groups that I've worked alongside. So yeah, it just felt like a good catchphrase for all of those things. It painted such a vivid picture and I think it helped people understand your heart. And so does that answer? Because when I think about folks like you who you're a pastor, you're a full-time nurse. Um, you have, you've bear the cross every day of being married to pastor Jake. Like <laughs> there's a lot that you have to balance. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I think it's really helpful to hear is it, it, it gave the sense of mission. And we're going to talk about that where one of the things that I resonated the most with your message was you were able to talk about you know, when we see the Holy Spirit being at work in Acts 2, it is this experience that we can bring into the church of 2024 in a way that, frankly, not a lot of us get to experience. We aren't very good at this, particularly in the American church. And what it requires is folks who have that sense of mission that you're describing, have that sense of identity or rootedness, um, I'm avoiding using the word calling because that is also a whole separate podcast, but you paint the picture of what the church is capable of. And you told this wonderful story about, you know, you've kind of tied this through line through a mission trip that you experienced with the Dominican Republic. Again, I say this every time, stop the podcast right now, click in the show notes where you can watch Barbara's sermon because I think it's critical that you do. But I want to spell out kind of specifically some of the things you walked through because when you talked about how when we do this well, when we are partnering with the Holy Spirit well, we are Jesus-centered communities uh, lead towards unity, they have more fun, and they're united on mission. Practically speaking, how have you seen those play out in your church experiences in the U.S.? Because I want people to understand that I think sometimes we overcomplicate this, and some of these things are actually more within our grasp than we may think. Yeah, I think, I mean, starting out with fun, like that's a really easy one to grasp hold of. Um, sometimes in church, we're so focused on what we're supposed to be doing. Worship, even greeting time is super formal. Like you yes. say whatever the person on stage told you to say and then move <laughs> on because you feel like you need to shake like five hands and then yes. I can go sit back down yes. again. But there's no reason like it can't be fun and just yeah. comfortable. And, you know, in the lobby space when we're meeting in between services, like just have fun and be with people just like you would at work if you were hanging out or at lunchtime with people. Um, I mean, it can be more organized events, I think, but it doesn't have to be complicated to yeah. have fun in church. Um, mission, I uh, got to organize a, a group. Well, it was more like a whole church event at a church we used to be at. And we just called it Serve Day. Right. And we went out into our community that day and served at different organizations that we already had partnerships with. But what I loved about it was there was something for everybody. So we had some elderly folks who couldn't move around very well or couldn't, you know, do hard physical labor, but they wanted to be part of it. Um, so we had things that they could do uh, on our serve day. We had things for families 
families with littles who often it's like, well, when my kids are older, then I can serve the church. No, we're all the church, like the littlest one all the way to the oldest person. We're all part of the body of Christ. And I think it's crucial that as we lean into being missional, we figure out ways for everybody to participate in that. Um, And on a Sunday, that can look really simple. Like maybe you have kids helping hand out bulletins at the door too. Like it doesn't have to be overly complicated or this big complex day for it to to be accomplished. Um, Unity, that's the one where it gets sticky, I think. Um, I touched on it a little bit, but I think when we talk about politics um, or just even differences in church um, preferences and doctrine, if we lean into the main things and keep those things, things, the main things, the majority of the time, Mm -hmm. like the gospel of Jesus and the fact that it's all about love and forgiveness and grace, like everybody believes those things, everybody wants those things. And we can lean into that unity and let those other side conversations be side conversations while we keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. I want to park in this idea of unity, not meaning uniformity, because I'm not the first to say this isn't the first podcast that talks about the idea that, you know, the church is one of those few remaining spaces where that can still be true. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you, you talked about politics on Sunday very briefly for those who are getting scared hearing us reference that. (laughs) Um, But there's a bunch of different versions of that conversation. And my assumption, I think why we embrace unity must mean uniformity is that it is easier or easier to achieve in the short term. And from communications, it is easier for me to look at anybody that is not with us and go, you are against us rather than accept the nuance that actually we agree on 99% of these things and all of them being main things. Mm -hmm. So can I set aside this 1% of differences to embrace that? But because of your church experience, it, it, one thing I'm curious about is what are the ways in which we sell the church short when we expect uniformity, because I think so often this theme of when we embrace what you were talking about on Sunday, we're living into the full potential of the church, the big C church, obviously. And yet when we don't do these things and fall into some of these practices that unfortunately so many of the folks listening are very familiar with, we are allowing the church to be much smaller and much more um, anemic than she was ever meant to be. So what what are we selling short when we expect uniformity instead of unity? We miss out on so much. Uh, it's definitely more comfortable to be uniform. It's easier. I mean, if Jake and I are hanging out with a family, it's easier if they have small kids in the same stage of life with us. It's just simpler. Uh, but it's we miss out on a lot of things. I miss out on the wisdom that an older couple might have to share with us and like the life experiences that they have. And I think the same thing translates to the church. It's easier if we get together with other church groups, other people who believe the exact same things, but we miss out on different perspectives. Um, we were at a church serving where it wasn't that they didn't welcome women as pastors, but they just hadn't had one in a long time. And they finally had a couple weeks where women could preach from the pulpit. And, um, I spoke on a passage and the pastor afterwards said to me, I've never thought of it from that perspective before. And I would never have thought to connect those two things, but because you're a woman, like that was natural to you. It came easy. Sure. And like the church needs that perspective or we miss out on that piece. So that's just one piece of it. But I think about our kids, like if they're always separated from us in church, we miss out on all the goodness that they bring to the table. And Jesus said, let the kids come to me. Like let the kids, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And so if we miss out on their perspective, we're missing part of the church, not the future church, but the kids who are part of our current church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, One of my favorite uh, speakers on the subject, Dr. Denise Kiesbo, she talks about how uh, there is no junior Holy Spirit. Right. And we accept this idea that like, oh, like we have to put kids up in like this waiting area as right. opposed to accepting that, you know, like there are ways to help them belong and, and contribute to the church and how yeah. that that deepens the richness of the experience for everybody. Yeah. One of my favorite things about being a part of this community is we have embraced multi-venue, which mm-hmm. allows for a, one of the outcomes of that is it has created a level of diversity and age yeah where we have a multitude of generations worshiping here which is one of my favorite things about this church and my kids running around and seeing part of 
the body um, that way, I think is the why we've seen so much fruit in them here mm. that we weren't necessarily seeing in other churches, not yeah, as a good. knock on those churches, but as something that God has done uniquely in this space. That was something as simple as, you know, uh, several years ago, them deciding to lean into that expression for this community. Mm-hmm. Cause the other thing that it makes you think about, this is something else that you said, which was a community led by the spirit holds its borders loosely. And it makes me think of that idea of like, we we've done it this way because we've always done it this way. But when you, I guess to start off a little bit higher uh, ground than that, what did you mean when you say that? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, as I was unpacking this text, uh, it just struck me how it would have been so easy for the new believers to exclude people around them. Like it would have been easy for the Jewish Christians to say, you're not Jewish. We are not accepting you into this community and move on from there. And we see them wrestling with that throughout the rest of the New Testament. So it wasn't that it was easy, but they still said yes to Gentiles, to Romans, to people outside of the borders of what they knew to be faith accepted in. Mm. I think in parts of the church, like big C church, um, we have almost reverted back and become like pharisaical in the way that we approach people outside of our community because we've put up these rules that different denominations have or different churches have that say if you do x y and z you can't be part of our community until the holy spirit moves in you and then we can't see those sins or those things that we exclude any longer and then you can be part and we say things like all are welcome but there are caveats to that in the fine print that we don't read And I just, as I was writing this, I said, what if we held those borders more loosely and just said, let the spirit bring in whoever the spirit wants to bring in. We'll worry about the details later, but like, what are we missing out on? Because we're not welcoming those people into our communities. Yeah. I, (laughs) it has never worked out in the history of the world for us to dictate where the Holy Spirit is capable of going. Yes. And yet most of church history is is full of that being a thing right and what i love about that picture of the church is churches that do that well or even seasons right like it's important to say you know there is there is no perfect church right the every church has done that well for a period of time there are certain churches though that have a culture of being more insular Mm -hmm. have a culture of being more um if you're not with us, then you're not welcome. And setting aside every possible judgment, the the heart cry there is what they're missing out on and what I'm missing out on when I do that in my personal life. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember something that that your husband said once about how, you know, when we begin to go like the gospels for everybody, except for that person, we are sitting in that pharisaical seat. And you, you said something else that I think is important to really drive home because holding its borders loosely is not, there are no borders. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Like there's part of this that is also embracing the idea that, uh, we have almost overcorrected denominations are a great example of this because one podcast isn't going to solve all the problems with a denomination conversation. Right. But we're able to look at, there is a richness and a beauty to the ways in which denominations are able to find different areas of focus or different areas of passion or things they're good at or what have you. And also, we have overcorrected to the point that if someone is not a part of the body, it looks ridiculous. I want to make sure we clarify, like holding borders loosely is not an empty uh, or lack of borders. Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's part of why I said it that way. Like we do have borders and we do believe that the spirit is transformative. And so there are some things that as people become part of a community of believers are going to be refined and changed within their lives. Uh, But I think the majority of that work is up to the spirit and the discipleship that churches put together. Yeah. Because if we're discipling people well, they're going to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus yeah. and that work will be done. Yeah. Uh, but we still, so we hold those borders, but we hold them very loosely allowing the spirit to bring in whoever it will. Yeah. One of the things that I'm particularly terrified about is uh, the ways in which the enemy has made me good at stuff. Mm. The idea there that like I can do a lot of these things in my own strength. Mm-hmm. I can create a program. I can create a service flow right. that can 
create an environment that feels nice to people. But you talked about the difference between something like that, which can be very cynical, very man-made, and ultimately very short-term, and being discipled by the Spirit. And again, discipleship by the Spirit is what you're talking about. Like Discipleship by other things is a weaker, smaller, and more anemic church. So it, it brings the question for, to mind for me, like if someone is hearing us have this conversation and they're having this sense of conviction or just kind of tracking with us and they're going like, man, we're a little off track or I'm a little off track. What are some of those ways in which you've done, you have done personally or you've seen churches sort of get back in line with being discipled by the spirit rather than some of these other things? Yeah, I think like a lot of other things, admitting it is the first step yeah. in recognizing it. Uh, and a lot of churches or, or church leaders are afraid to, to do that. Um, but when they do, it's really beautiful. And taking that moment to just say, wow, I really screwed up. Like, I need to repent from this. And then taking a pause and time to pray and just yeah. sit and say, okay, how more specifically have I messed this up? I'm feeling this conviction in my heart, but like, where did I go wrong? And what are those specific ways that the spirit can define for me, this is where I got off track. And then from there, uh, for me in times when I notice that I'm out of line with the spirit, often it's, I've gotten my priorities out of line and I'm not spending time in scripture. I'm not praying. I'm not taking those moments and I get really out of whack. So I think that's the first step. Um, then I think listening to the community around them and in some churches that that will be their church context. And in others, it might mean taking a beat and listening to the wider community around you. Like, what are people who are not a part of your church community saying? What are they needing? Uh, For a pastor, maybe that means setting up meetings with school school leaders, uh, with principals and school counselors. Maybe you listen to your local government, like, uh, mayors and that kind of thing, and just see, like, what are the needs in our community and where am I missing that because oftentimes I find that the spirit directs us to those things so if we're not able to hear the spirit well and we feel like we're missing it sometimes those people even if they're not part of the church can help kind of bring us back into the right arena at least and then you know through through prayer and discernment and just talking to your people you can kind of figure out like okay what are some next steps we can take and then be willing to fail. Like you might take a step and the spirit's like, nope, that's not really where we're going. So, okay, I'm going to pivot and try something else until we feel like, okay, this is back in line with where the spirit is leading us, bathing the whole thing in prayer and moving forward from there. Yeah. It it makes me think of too, you know, the ability to see outside of your own community, even in church resources, like uh, you and I were talking about before we turned the mics on the ruthless elimination of hurry, right? Like the ability to go, um, you know, I feel like that's like the most quoted book on every uh, Christian podcast, but that's a separate conversation because <laughs> really it's, it's illustrative to the yeah. idea of how important it is to talk about, to live in what you're talking about. Like if you are feeling out of whack to check back into the, some of these basic spiritual practices right. that we all know that most of us aren't doing. Mm-hmm. And that when we, uh, that definition of spiritual maturity being, you know, spiritual, the most spiritual mature person is the f- first one to realize and turn around. Right. Um, so where I want to land the plane here, you said something else that almost made me like stand up and start shouting things, but it would have been a (laughs) distraction because you talked about how a full expression of faith must be communal. Yeah. And there's a, there's a thousand different area, uh, places we could take that, uh, just that little point of, uh, nugget of wisdom, but it immediately made me think of my kids. Um, my middle, your oldest are, wonderful friends. So this is personal for even for you and I, Yeah, because they're growing up in a world. I always use John 10, 10 as this reference point here that will tell them they have life to the full or they can have life to the full and the church doesn't need to be a part of it. Personally, I don't subscribe to a lot of, uh, war on church kind of stuff, except for that one. The, so to start things off though, like how do you reconcile this, this clear need we have for community our clear wiring and our own behaviors that lead towards isolation? Cause we're not, we're also not very good at this. Right. Yeah. In the whole sermon, there were a couple things I said that I wondered if people might have questions about, but I think that this might be the most countercultural thing I said in the whole sermon when you really unpack it. 
we are so taught by our culture that we need to be driven and we need to be achieving the very best that we can all the time. And that means our careers and our children, like they need to be scheduled out the wazoo. Summer's <laughs> coming. And I feel like so many people are doing like camps and sports and, and trying to pack in all these extras so that their kids will be the most prepared when yeah. they go to first grade in the fall. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I don't know if I want my kindergartner doing all of those things. Yeah. Um, but even in church, we, in recent church history have adapted that right with like seeker friendly models for church and it's become so consumeristic in ways that match our greater culture. But in order to reach community or to be part of community, I think we have to let go of some of those things and make space for community in our own lives. And our, all of our other parts of our lives are oriented towards isolation. I go to work. I do my job there. I take my kids to their activities. I, you know, and part of these specific social groups outside of my work and that's it. Um, and that really can be an insular life and we can just live our lives off of our own school and kids and work calendars and never Mm -hmm. get outside our community if we don't make space for that. Um, I think that's why we were talking about the ruthless elimination of hurry beforehand because it has to be intentional or it'll fall by the wayside. So I think as churches, as church leaders, part of our responsibility is to helping to be helping disciple people in that way. Like community is not optional if you're part of a faith group. Um, I used a quote from Tish uh, Harrison Warren's book um, about liturgy in our ordinary lives. And it said that our expression of faith is never less than our personal relationship with Christ, but it's always more than that. And as I shared the story from the Dominican with the first time I took communion, I realized in that moment as a junior higher that my faith is part of a global expression of faith. Mm. Yes, it's my personal faith and my my faith within my local church community, but it's so much more than that and so much more than the American church. But there are people all around the world who are doing this. And we're part of that tradition that goes back thousands of years. And so... We can't do our faith in isolation. It's just not possible to actually be part of a genuine faith if we're wanting a full expression and not an anemic expression of that. Yeah, that's so good. There's a There was a survey that I looked up before we started this conversation, which it's talked about how in 2018, only 16% of Americans reported that they felt very attached to their local community. And when I think about a stat like that, which I can only assume, you know, anything pre COVID, I can only yeah. assume it's exponentially worse now. Right. Um, to be counter-cultural, counter-cultural, it requires the church to go first. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we have this hope or this expectation or this desire that we're going to make this thing or make this event or do this program and the floodgates are going to open up and that just isn't God is capable of all things. So if you are, if you can make an event and have thousands of people show up just cause you made the event, please email me. Uh, my, my contact information is in the show notes because I would <laughs> love to talk to you. Um, but for the vast majority of us, we are operating in a different context. I always talk about how, yeah. you know, I came to the faith as an adult and I think the church at large tends to forget how easy it is to not be a part of itself because the vast majority of people have been a part of church since they were a kid. And when, when I think about the idea that 84% of people at minimum are walking around feeling like with no attachment to the local community, Mm -hmm. that is such a wonderful opportunity for the church because so often we are trying to do the things that we are seeing in culture We're trying to make the best online church experience or whatever. Yeah. And not always, but it's worth asking the question, hey, what if actually what we're doing is creating the best in-person experience possible? Mm -hmm. Because this is the only in-person experience people are getting. We had a small group experience at a previous church where we met 51 out of 52 weeks one year. And all that Lauren and I did was go, hey, like every Wednesday we're having food bring something to contribute. 
it was a lot of 22 year olds. And usually meant that Lauren was doing a lot of, a lot of extra work because a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like sour cream and like mozzarella cheese was brought pretty much yeah. every time. Right. But that was all the expectation we put and people kept showing up because it was the only home, home only home cooked meal they had all week. Yeah. Right. There's a simplicity to that, but the church is the only place that that can happen mm-hmm. or one of the only places that can happen. Um, to put a really fine point on it, when you think about the type of church, the type of faith that you want your girls to be able to have, be able to experience, what are the things that you would want the church to be doing now? What are the things you want people listening to being able to do now that are going to help set up that church to exist? Um, because we that's the work we can do now for that to be possible. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really a beautiful example of having people over to your home, having a home cooked meal. One thing Jake and I have tried to do periodically is to just look at our calendar and say, do we have space? Like, do we have a weeknight, uh, uh, something on a weekend maybe where we can just know that we have space to have people over and make time in our house? And sometimes that's church people that we're having over. Um, But the other thing is like, meet your neighbors, meet the people around you and make the ask, even though that's really scary because of how isolated our culture is, especially post COVID. I think people are really scared to say like, Hey, just come over. We're cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, like come hang out. Uh, But sometimes that connection point can be all it takes to start a relationship. And then as people live in community and friendship with you, they see like, Oh, there's something attractive about what that church is doing. And I would never have gone to that event that they planned a month ago, but now I know somebody there. So it's not just a church building that holds who knows what for that person and their history, but now they have a face that they can connect with and say, yeah, I want to be part of that. And those events are good for people to get connected once they can get in the door, but they're never going to get in the door if, if we're so separated. So I think making space, meeting your neighbors, um, leaning into that bravery and saying, I'm just going to ask, like, do you want to go grab coffee? Do you want to go out for a meal? Do you want to come over? Um, maybe we want to go for a walk in the park, but just, I think so many people are looking for that connection. Um, as a mom, especially when I was a new mom, I felt very isolated with my, with my kiddo, with Emilio when she was a baby but I found that all the other moms were too. Like we all felt the same way. (laughs) We're all like trapped in our houses with our kids and scared because we have no community or whatever around us. But every time I would ask or another mom would ask me like, hey, do you want to get our kids together sometime and hang out? The answer was almost always yes. Yeah. Um, And so people are hungry for it. I think we just have to be willing to make that step and make that ask. And if the church were to commit to do that, Um, I think about church campaigns that different churches have done, like commit to this, this or this. But I think if the church were to commit to say, I'm going to clear one block of time off my calendar, that makes sense for me. I'm going to commit to keeping that open for relationships with other people. And I'm going to commit to making a scary ask, a scary invitation, like once a month. I just imagine that the community would grow in really cool ways. Yeah. Well, that is a delightful place to leave it because- there's such practical wisdom there. And I think, again, in this entire conversation, you know, I remember we were talking to some friends after the first week of this uh, series, talking about the Holy Spirit. And it was very clear that this was a conversation that they were not well-versed in. It's a conversation I'm not well-versed in. Most people in most American churches are not particularly well-versed in how yeah. to have a conversation about this in a healthy context. And I loved how many different times you were able to point people to like, oh, that's a thing I could do. Mm-hmm. However, it's a thing we can do when we are being discipled by the spirit. And that's ultimately what's going to make the difference. So thank you so much for the time. Thanks everybody for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.